Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. I'm Mark Goldman, your host, and in this episode, we sat down with Michael Tompkins from New Braunfels, Texas. Michael's a CPA, however, he works in the IT industry now. We talked to him about his journey from starting with his mother and father's CPA firm in Houston, through working at Deloitte and working in IT audit, to feeling a true calling to start an IT business in New Braunfels, Texas. It's worked out very well for him. Michael has definitely achieved a, a certain level of success and and he shares some, some good gems about mistakes and good decisions, as well as his brief encounter with Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. So I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Hey, thank you for coming on the Life in Accounting Where Accounts Go podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to schedule this. You have a very interesting story from the time <laughs> from the time I met you at the CPA Society. I, at first, honestly, I thought you were the controller for a technology company <laughs> being a CPA, and, and then I realized you owned the thing. And so I've really wanted to get you on the podcast. And so if you don't mind, if you can fill in some sure. of the gaps and some of your background, we'd love to hear how you became a tech guy. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. You know, really kind of started, I, I actually kind of grew up in an accounting firm. My mom and dad in Houston have a, a small accounting firm there. And so I kind of grew up doing whatever they needed, doing the bookkeeping, tax returns you know, doing the data entry part of it and kind of doing running the tech at their office, doing doing all the IT. And so, you know, it, it didn't take me too long to realize that I really in, enjoyed the tech part of things more so than I did doing tax returns. They were kind of resistant to putting in new technologies and I'd kind of push them. And of course, everything didn't hit, but a lot of things we would put in an automated appointment system or something as opposed to their paper appointment system that they were all writing down and got lost all the time. So doing things like that and being able to see the result afterwards that they would kind of have this change of heart of, hey, you know, we couldn't go back to how we did it before. This has helped us so much and, you know, saved us so much time doing this this way or with this new technology we have now. So I really kind of grew a, a passion for enjoying that and, and getting to see that transformation of seeing, wow, technology really can save them money and, and make them more efficient. And so that's kind of where I got the, the initial drive to start this. I went on to Texas A&M where I got an undergrad in accounting and got a master's in, in management information systems and, and got my CPA as part of that. And, and I worked at Deloitte for about two years. And I didn't really necessarily have, you know, I wish I could say I had this all planned out that I was going to work at Deloitte for a while and stop and start this company. But I, I really didn't have a plan as much as I probably should have. And as much as looking back now, it seems obvious, but I was working at Deloitte doing IT auditing, like SOX related work. And my sister is, is an optometrist here in New Braunfels, and we were up visiting her one time. And I just remember we were, we were driving around, and it's it's even years later very vivid to me, driving around, sitting in the back of her car, just looking around New Braunfels. And I just remember this overwhelming feeling that the Lord was telling me, you need to move up here and start an IT business. I mean, it was just clear the day. So after that, it took about a year kind of working at it and getting it all figured out. But then I did quit working at Deloitte and we moved up to New Braunfels and I started this company that was about three years ago. And so that's kind of how I've gotten to, to where I am now. 
So you truly had a calling. Yeah. To start the yeah, IT I, company. Yeah, it really was. I I mean, like I said, looking back, it seems like an obvious path to take of growing up doing the IT and getting CPA, but I really didn't. I wish I could take more credit for saying I had this master plan to, to start the company, but I, I really didn't. You know, I just felt that calling and it was kind of a leap of faith, but I really felt like, hey, this is the Lord's will for me to do this. So that's what I did. That's wonderful. You know, one of the things I found interesting about your background was it looks like you got your IT degree and accounting degree around the same time and very quickly became a CPA. Were you sort of pursuing both paths at the same time or how did that work? Yeah, you know, it, it's really nice. A&M has a great program that I'll definitely plug for anyone listening. It, it really is, is. They really set it up well. They call it the PPA program. So you get your undergrad in accounting, and then you can kind of choose like a track of what you want to get your master's in. So you can do finance, tax, audit, or IT, MIS track, which is what I did. And so it's a five-year program. I came into A&M with a lot of college credit, so I did it in four years. But that's kind of how it works. And it's really nice because the way they set it up is that your last semester of school, you basically only take three or six hours of courses and you can just study for the CPA exam. So by the time you go start working, you've, in theory, you know, have have finished and passed the CPA exam. You're not having to pull these working 70 hours a week at a public accounting firm and trying to go home and study for the CPA exam at at the same (laughs) time, which I saw a lot of people doing. And, you know, I, I don't think I could do that. That That'll burn you out pretty quick. So I was fortunate that the A&M set that up so I could get it all knocked out by the time I started working. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a smart move. I think becoming a CPA is, well, just just an amazingly influential, it was an amazingly influential step in my own career. And I'm sure you see it that way as well for yourself. Even though you don't work in that area anymore, it still makes a difference. It really is incredible the, the difference it's made. I don't think that I would be, so our company, we focus on serving CPA firms. And if I didn't have the CPA, I just wouldn't have the credibility that I do being able to come in. It it really is kind of this aha moment. You know, when I say that, they're kind of like, oh, really? You're a, you're a CPA and you do IT? And <laughs> it really does bring a credibility that, that it would be hard to get without having the, the certification. Sure, you understand IT, but at the same time, you have some insight into their business because you exactly. took the same classes, took the same certification. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. And have like even worked in it. <laughs> and even worked in it. That's right. So when yep. you were at Deloitte, did yep. you start out in IT audit? or? Yeah, Deloitte recruits pretty heavily from this people that go into this MIS track to get people to come out. And you just start, you know, as part of Sarbanes-Oxley, the audit side, you know, they're obviously auditing the books, but we have to audit the systems that produce those books so that you know that the books are accurate. So we have to go in and kind of map out all the IT systems that are integral and in producing their financial statements, which in these big companies is, is quite a few. So then we have to go in and do audits of that. So yeah, I, I graduated and kind of just went straight into that. And it really is is good experience. I mean, working at Deloitte or in any big four, you obviously work a lot, but boy, you really don't get that kind of experience anywhere else. Sure. You you pay a little bit of a price, but you learn quite a bit. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So tell me more about your company. When did you start CPA Technology Group? So yeah, we started about three years ago. And when we first started, we didn't have that vision of just doing CPA firms. I had, had thought about it and I, was, I wasn't I was sure if that was a sustainable market, if, if we could reach out geographically enough to have enough CPA firms to service. So kind of started out generic and then it, it really was about, it was about a year and a half or two years later that I realized, hey, what am I thinking? I've got a CPA. I have this accounting background there are lots of CPA firms. I mean, a lot of them are, are smaller and we're usually, you know, our cutoff is kind of five, it has to be five or more for the economics to make sense. But there are a lot of firms. There are a lot of firms that meet that criteria. And so I 
kind of came to that realization and that's when we really kind of oriented around focusing on this niche and just serving CPA firms. Okay. So you're about a year, year and a half into the niche. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. And so far it's proved really beneficial. I mean, when a CPA firm is looking for an IT provider, we have quite a leg up being able to come in and me say, hey, I'm a CPA and we serve CPA firms over most IT companies that will take anyone that'll write them a check. And to me, I really, you know, there's obviously the the aspect of keeping the lights on, you know, you got to keep that (laughs) base level of, of IT, right? That's kind of expected. But I don't particularly enjoy that very much. I really enjoy getting to that next level of like business process improvement and understanding their workflows. And like I said, being able to come in, say, hey, well, you're doing it this way. Well, we can put in this technology that what you're doing now will take 30% or 50% less time than it does. And and it's hard to get to that level if you don't focus on an industry. I don't know what efficiencies can be had in the transportation industry if we had a client in that. So I really like being able to focus on CPAs and really drilling down to understanding them so that we can present solutions specific to them that can really help them improve a lot. Just ballpark, what percentage of your business is accounting firms versus other industries? Or is it a little too early to be looking at that? We still have some clients from before we started focusing on CPA firms, but we won't take any new clients now that it's not, I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be a CPA firm. It could be an accounting or or I guess what you would say a bookkeeping and tax firm. They can't use the word accounting, but bookkeeping and tax firm, they don't necessarily have to be CPAs, but it has to be that that type of industry. So now well over more than more than half of our businesses, CPAs or accounting firms. That's wonderful. You're really all in on the niche. Yeah. That's very smart. very smart. We are we are all in. Yeah, I mean, we've turned down business. I've had medical office come, hey, can you do RT? And it really is hard to scale, I think, if you start taking on these other clients. Because like I said, I I just don't understand all what all goes on in the medical industry. So yeah, we've just said, nope, sorry, we just do CPAs or, or accounting firms. Okay. Well, I like the yeah. podcast to help people and various aspects of their career choices. And so I have a question for you. Frequently, I talk to people that are thinking about going out on their own, hanging out the shingle in the old terminology, thinking about starting their own practice. And it's my opinion, I feel that's going to happen more and more as large firms merge in local firms and and become regional. And and then also with just the work-life balance choices people are making, I think more and more you're going to see people starting small firms. So for someone that's looking to start their own accounting firm, you know, they're already a CPA, they've got a few years experience, and they're thinking about going out on their own. What advice would you have for them, either in the general business area or in the technology area? My advice would really be more on on the business side. And it's something that I have learned the hard way, unfortunately, and and that it really took me about two years to come to this realization. Those are the best lessons. Yeah, they they are they are hard hard learned. It looking back now, I think, oh gosh, I wasted so much time. But my advice would be, if if you are going to go out on your own, you have to understand that you are in sales. You can't go out thinking like, oh, I can be an entrepreneur, but not be in sales because you have to be. You're the owner of the business, and so I think a lot of people, including myself, used to have this. Oh, sales is a dirty word. I don't want to have, I don't really have to go do that. That's kind of just, you know, sleazy people go do sales, but it really is not like that. If if you're going to go out on your own, you're going to have to be your company salesman. And you can't just think, and what I thought and was incredibly naive looking back now is that, well, I can start this company and I can just build a great product. If I build this great IT service, then people just flock to me. They'll just find me. And I don't really have to go spend money on sales and marketing. That's just a waste. And if you have that attitude, you're pretty much on the path to going out of business. And I have come to that realization, like I said, the hard way. And fortunately, because of other people in my life have learned that 
I am in sales, and, and now I actually really enjoy going out and doing the sales. I, I would like to long-term hire someone, hire people to do all the technical portion and me go out and, and be doing the sales because that I really have started to enjoy it, but it took me a while to come to that realization that if you're an entrepreneur, you you are in sales. Okay. Okay. Well, another question for you. The stereotype of accountants is is that we're introverted, we're not as outgoing, and which, by the way, I believe is obviously it does not apply in all cases. It's it's not a hundred percent true. But for those of us that are, do you have any ideas on how to get yourself out of that box and out of that comfort zone? And is there anything you did to help you with that? I would just say that you kind of have to just do it and, and get out there. That it's hard to. Of course, like I have kind of started out doing some seminars, technology-related seminars at, at the San Antonio CPA Society there. And before that, I really hadn't done that much. And it was kind of nice starting small. Some of those only had like 15 people in them. But still getting up and doing a two-hour presentation is kind of nerve-wracking. And But I just kind of knew this is what I have to do if I'm going to grow the business and just getting out there and doing it. Now I'm doing some in front of 150 or 200 people and it's just not that big of a deal to me now. Now that I've done it, I've kind of gotten over this fear of getting out there and speaking and everything. And I wish there was an easy way to get over it before you go do it, but I don't think there really is. It just (laughs) takes practice and and it doesn't take too long. uh, I don't think of doing it and getting out there and getting in front of people to to kind of get over it. But you kind of just have to get out there. Yeah, that's great advice. And honestly, probably the most direct and open, honest answer you could have given. I found the same thing. I think one of the inaccuracies is people think that if someone is up talking in front of a group that they're not nervous, that, you know, they were just born that way. And that's not how you get there. Even to this day when I do. Yeah, it's not like that at all because I'm I'm an introvert. I mean, if I never had to get in front of someone again in the rest of my life, you know, you wouldn't hear me complaining. But <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not someone that was just born. Oh, I can just get up and talk in front of people and it's no big deal. I'm definitely not that type. I wish I could say I, I was. I'm not. But it is possible to learn and to get get over that. You don't have to be born with these awesome public speaking skills. I, I don't really think many people are um, to be able to get out there and, and get in front of people. Yes. And actually, the two industries you've worked in, being self-employed and then public accounting, those skills are highly important in both of those. They really are. Yeah. Those soft skills of, of communication are, are really some of the most important. Yeah. For me, I think just reading business books helped out a lot and then getting out and forcing yourself to do it, no matter how bad it is the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is good advice. That is another thing I've done is trying to read more. It's easy to get caught up in reading about current events and just reading the Wall Street Journal or whatever, but really picking up a, a good book, you can really learn a lot from that. Yeah, it's stretching I, your I've, mind. I've realized that's that's much more beneficial than reading the latest headlines in politics. Yes, definitely. All right, Michael. Well, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask about this because I looked online in a few places and in your newsletter, and I've seen the same picture several times of you (laughs) and Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, a.k.a. (laughs) Mr. Wonderful. So tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. So I was at a conference recently with a peer group I'm a part of, of other IT companies, and and we meet quarterly, and they bring in different speakers as part of that. And Mr. Wonderful came in a few weeks ago and got to see him and and get my picture with him and see him speak some. And so it's pretty interesting. He's a a really interesting guy. He's really kind of built a billion-dollar business from his bootstraps. He got a $10,000 loan from his mom and sold the company for $3.4 billion, I think. He seems rather ruthless on TV, although obviously insightful and successful. I mean, is he like that in real life? You know, you would you would think, yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched Shark Tank quite a bit, and, and he's always grilling people. But, you know, in, in real life, he's really not like that. He's surprisingly down to earth. Before the conference started where he was speaking, we had 
a little area where we were all getting breakfast and he just came down and sat down at a table and started eating breakfast and was really willing to engage with us. You know, you think those kind of people would be kind of put offish, but he really seems passionate about helping business owners grow their companies. I mean, he truly seems to enjoy that. And so it was pretty interesting to see that kind of side of him that you don't really see on TV. Okay. Now tell me the truth. Did you make him an offer on your company? Did, <laughs> did, did you try? I, I, he's up on the stage. They actually did this, what they call hot seats where IT companies could kind of submit to go up and kind of ask him questions about their business. And he'd look over their financials and and hearing him talk was kind of intimidating. You know, he'd, he'd be like, yeah, well, you're close to a million. I mean, getting to a million, that's that's easy. Five million revenue a year. Now, that's, that's a little tougher. Then once you get to 10, getting to 10 is, is pretty hard. So he's, he's talking in these huge numbers. I'm like, yeah, that's a little intimidating. I, I think he'd give me quite a hard time if I went up there on stage. Maybe you can make a licensing arrangement or something with him. That seems to be his thing. <laughs> yeah, that, it does. You're right. <laughs> Well, we're getting to the end of the podcast, and, and there's four mm-hmm. questions I end every podcast with. But before that, sure. we call this life in accounting because it's not just about accounting, it's about life. Sure. And before the show, you and I were talking about other interests, and you mentioned that you particularly have an interest in studying Christian apologetics as well as supporting several different nonprofits, it sounds like. Is there anything you'd like to plug in that arena or any upcoming events or you know anything you found enlightening uh, that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, well, like you said, yeah, I, I am very passionate about Christian apologetics, which if, if you're not familiar, is not apologizing for your faith, which you kind of think when you first hear it. It's actually <laughs> providing a defense of the Christian faith using intellect and reason. And so that's really an area that I particularly enjoy. And then, yeah, we do support some nonprofits around New Braunfels helping kids. And, and my wife and I sponsor some children through a ministry called Compassion International, where you kind of give a monthly support to help a child. So we have a child in India and one in Honduras. And that's really interesting. You get to write them letters and they send you pictures and everything. So it's kind of nice getting to feel like they're giving back. It's really important for me. How long have you been sponsoring the children? One of them has been about six years, I think. And then another one's probably been about two years. So yeah, it's, it's really neat the way they the way they work it. That, you know, it makes you feel like your dollars are going to more when it's the specific individual. You're not just donating money to a general fund, but, you know, they really set it up like because you gave this money, this child is getting support, is getting food, is getting schooling and, and things like that. So it's really a neat program. So you've gotten to see that child grow up through the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So they both awesome. send pictures occasionally. Yeah. It's pretty neat. And kind of getting to know that if we weren't doing this, they might have a different life than they do. So, I That's mean, we're awesome. blessed to be able to do that. That's awesome. I always like yeah. to talk about these things in life and accounting because work-life balance is such a common item to talk about these days. And I think it's not all about schedule. It's about having something else in your life other than work to balance it with. Sure. So some other interests. So, yeah. So let me get down to putting you on the hot seat. Uh, I've done this with every other (laughs) guest, but I think there's some really good questions. First of all, what has been your proudest moment? Yeah, you know, I would probably say the birth of my children. We have two young children, and that really is a lot more important to me than anything anything work related. I mean, that's all pretty fleeting. So, really getting to see see them being born is quite an experience, and really enjoyed that. Okay, as a father, I think you have to say that. Right? <laughs> and yeah, that's true. right. Yeah, it is. It is true, <laughs> boy. It's something else. That's for sure. Well, this next one, I know you know you're a business owner, so this one, I don't know, maybe easier or maybe that much harder. Tell us about a mistake you've made, and the more colossal, the better. Well, and what you learn from it. I'll go back to what I said earlier. Starting this business and being naive and thinking that I can just build this great product in in a vacuum, and and people will flock to me. They'll just find out about me. 
I mean, it cost me about two years. I think I'd be a lot further along if I had that realization before I started the business. You know, it's interesting. Another person that I've gotten to see speak is a guy named George Frimpong. He's the VP of sales for Robert Hershevik, the other guy on Shark Tank. You know, oh, he's, yes. he's, he's grown an IT company, started with three guys. It was Robert, this George, who's the VP of sales, and then one other guy. They started the company and grew it. It's now $150 million a year company. And so that VP of sales came in and spoke. And so it was really kind of reinforced this notion of, of hearing how they started the business that, you know, when they first started, he told some stories about how a customer wanted to come see their knock, which is like your network operations center where you have all these fancy screens and techs working away, monitoring everything. And so a potential client said, well, we want to come kind of see your, see your knock. Well, these three guys, they, they didn't have anything like that. So they they went out to Best Buy and bought a bunch of monitors and, and paid two of their friends to come sit in this room and, and act like they were doing something <laughs> when when these guys came by. And, yeah, yeah, here's here's our knock, here's where we're monitoring everything. And so it just kind of reinforced this notion that they knew that, hey, if we can sell it, then we can deliver. And so they really focused on sales first. Contrasting that with, he said, a competitor of theirs who's now out of business started out and they first went and spent all this capital they had building out this fancy operation center that people could come look at and oh it was so great and they didn't focus on the sales and they they went out of business so really just this idea of, of focusing on the sales first and then kind of building it out as you go because I mean when you first start you don't necessarily know what people want. So if you just go building something without doing the sales and marketing and understanding that first, then you're really just wasting a lot of time, Like, which is what I did. I think that's commonly called fake it till you make it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and and it, it really is true. That's what you have to do. <laughs> it sounds like you're sort of a constant learner from life and you're always open to learning from others. So this may be an easy question, but who's been the biggest mentor? thus far in your career? Yeah, you know, I would say someone who's, who's influenced me a lot, whose biography I've read is a guy named R.G. Letourneau. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, Mark. Back in the 40s and 50s, he ran a company that they made the majority of all the earth-moving equipment and vehicles that were used in World War II. They made like 70% of this company, and he kind of started the company from nothing. And what really sticks out to me that I like about him is he really started out the business and said, I'm going to commit to making God my business partner. And as he grew, he really stuck to that to the point of he gave away 90% of his income to, to charitable causes. And people would come ask him, well, why do you give so much money away? And And he would say, the question is not how much of my money I give to God, but rather how much of God's money I keep for myself. And that really has kind of stuck with me. That really, I ultimately do feel like this is God's business, not mine. And I'm a steward of, of the resources he's given me. So kind of reading about his life has, has been a big inspiration to me. You know, actually, I think I have seen a video by either him or a family member yeah. Um, right now, media, which actually, I guess it couldn't be him. It would have to be second generation. I'm thinking, have they left their entire company to a trust at this point? Does that sound familiar or maybe that's have. somebody different? I, yeah, no, they they probably haven't. I know they there's R.G. Letourneau University. I think it's out in Longview in, in Texas here. Um, Interesting. That there's kind of a, it's a private university out there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, the question I always end with is, what's the best advice you've ever received that you'd like to pass on to our listeners? Well, I would say I hate to beat a dead horse, but focus on sales. That's probably the best business advice that I've received. Outside of that, keeping your priorities straight, that this business is important to me. And if you listen to someone like Kevin O'Leary, and, and I don't really agree with this, he says, if you're going to start a business, you should basically, he doesn't say it quite like this, but essentially you should forget about your family, forget about everything else and just focus on making money for X number of years. And, and then once you're done, you can just relax. But I, I don't really subscribe to that view. I think 
what I'm doing is important, but it really is not as important as spending time with my family and kind of having that balance. So keeping those priorities straight has been advice I've received and is difficult to do in practice because when you are running your own business, it's very easy to get caught up in the business and just wanting to work all the time. I mean, I enjoy working on it, but I have to remember that it's not the most important thing in my life. Yes. Yeah. As the father of a 10 year old, I completely agree. <laughs> completely. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, you're in the same boat. You understand. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much, Michael. couple yeah, last things. Me on. Sure. If I'm a, a CPA in this local area, first of all, how do we contact you? If we want to talk to you about your services, what's the best way? Probably the easiest thing is go to our website, cpatechgroup.com, and you can get our number and all our information on there. And if you are interested, we will come out and we'll do a free security assessment for your firm and we'll kind of give you a nice report of where we think you stand and what we think you can improve on. There's no obligation or anything tied to it. It's just something, a service we offer so that firms can kind of get to know us a little better. Wonderful. And what area do you service, actually? Is it just San Antonio, or are you reaching up into Austin? What's Yeah, we go up into Austin. We have some clients in Austin, really San Antonio, Austin, and, and some in Houston, but mainly kind of this central Texas corridor from Austin to, to San Antonio is, is mainly where we're serving right now. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you again. This has been really a treat. I appreciate you coming on the Life in Accounting, Where Accountants Go podcast, and I hope to see you at a CPA event sometime soon. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Yeah, thanks for having me on. No problem. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Well, that was my interview with Michael Tompkins of CPA Tech Group, and I think we have several good takeaways from this. First of all, obviously, if you have a firm or are thinking of starting a firm and you're looking for a good technology company, Michael can be contacted through his website at cpatechgroup.com. Secondly, Michael talked about the importance of being a CPA and where that has led him in his career. And and I think there's a good takeaway from that as well. While it's certainly a sacrifice and and certainly expensive and, and you have to put some things on hold to pursue any certification, having that certification can help you in many ways in your career and life even if you end up working in a different area. So until next time, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please visit our website at whereaccountantsgo.com. Click on the podcast page and click on the subscribe button. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, we'll see you soon. There's more to come.